The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell Obviously, be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process, and hopefully, you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors, or simply download the app. This series is brought to you by Hub24, one of Australia's leading providers of integrated platform technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for value for money and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm here with Troy Theobald. Troy is a founder and head of financial services at RFS Advice. Uh, he's won pretty much all the awards that you can win but uh, been regularly listed in the Barron's Top 50 Advisor, Financial Standards, Power 50, uh, IFA Excellence Awards, Investment Advisor of the Year uh, and a bunch of stuff. He's been in the industry for uh you know, for a fair while, I'll let him tell the story on that side, but uh, keen to learn from some of those lessons and, uh, yeah, some of his, his tips on how to create the amazing business that he's done through RFS. Troy, thanks for joining us, mate. Thank you, Ben, and thank you for being nice on the time in the industry there. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, I'll, I'll let you tell the story, but I know that you've got, you've got a deep experience there, which... Um, yeah, obviously, it's been a journey in your business. So maybe that's a good place to start, and no doubt you're going to tell it in better words than me. But can you tell us about your your journey into advice and how you've ended up where you are today? Yeah, probably. I mean, staff now have selected it as a profession, which is fantastic. But back in the dear old 90s when I came through and did an accounting degree, and as did a number of the directors on our license, uh, had a similar path. We, we uh, went to university, did an accounting degree, started an accounting Worked out they expected you to be sitting in a chair at 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. and you weren't going to be near a client for about 10 or 15 years. Somewhere along that journey, you think, this isn't for me. And, and luckily, the firm I was at uh, on the southern and the Gold Coast, they had a planner who'd come back from Merrill Lynch in Japan and um, did this thing called financial planning. And uh, and I was the offsider at the time, and myself and, uh, and one of the fellow co-directors, Brad Wall, met at the very first thing back at Advisor Investment Services days in the 90s and the two two advisors we were with, the two of the largest at the time and we were the young punks that they thought were there to uh, probably serve them lunch and um, I think that's back when we were like, oh no, we're, we're power planners as in, you know, sub-professionals. So that's, that, that's as far back as it started and that journey then came through working with an accounting firm building, uh, building that business there and then... Um, Opportunity came up with a much larger accounting firm that was in BRW Top 100 accounting firm that assured me they didn't have enough high net worth clients to have an advisor. So I offered even to do tax returns, and within the first two weeks, I was that busy with planning and never looked back. So, so that that ran well for a decade. They shared the uh, shared the office, took care of that, but it was a a bit of a lonely journey. And employee number one still here with me today, and and you were a jack of all trades doing everything back then, and. You, you do get tired and you get concerned about burnout. You meet some right people along the way. And uh, that's where I actually had met with Paul Forbes, who was GM of professional investment services at that time, to um, 
to come over and buy the other half of the business and, and take that burden off and just allow. I like seeing clients. I like managing the portfolios. Uh, I'm not overly excited as Ben has seen me with tech today. There's lots of things that I know I'm really bad at, so I love to outsource those. Uh, so having that relationship's worked really well. We've gone from strength to strength there and just really tried to build out that offering along the way. Absolutely. And uh, we are just chatting a bit before we fired up the recording and your the space that you play in is that that sort of pre and post retiree space and talking about your your team structure you've got things set up in a way that allows you to deliver a, an award winning service but do it across large numbers of clients in a really effective way you mentioned that you're personally the sort of frontline advisor for around 300 clients as well as you know heavily involved in the running of your license plus all of the you know media content team um things that you're doing and, you know, jumping in from time to time on some of the other advisors' meetings. How do you structure things to to be able to work at that that level of, of volume but do it in a way where you're maintaining the quality that you want to be delivering for your clients? Yeah, so a couple of components. I mean, you've got to be systemized to do it. So we have we, – we empower the, the key sort of – call it middle management or high management now to control and build the system with the team. And we used to laugh, it's RFS version 10, version 20 version. So if we get to a point, now we've got 20, 21 odd staff now. When Paul joined, we had three. So we've had to change approaches and you get to pressure points. And when we do get to those, we just literally jump in the room and go, where are the pressure points? And Paul will do that regularly, probably on a six month basis. And, and things that worked for a team of five won't work for 10 and won't work for 20. I, I wish there was an off the shelf solution in financial services, I haven't seen one yet. Love someone to build one, I'll gladly take it. But um, mm. we've had to adjust it along the way. So we've we've built that team approach now. It looks a lot like accounting firm where you can have the primary advisor or the senior partner and such. Uh, they'll have fully qualified advisors under them that do 90% of the work in contact with the client. And it gives them contact with the client much earlier in their career with higher net worth clients. They're in the room and decisions are made. So it makes it a more exciting role for them. And then off the back of that, then we'll add administration and uh, graduates under that and bring them through that way. So it's taken us a while to get to that approach because it's love to say we tried them all at the start and they worked perfectly. They didn't. Reality is you try a few things and, and um, you know, we did one of the advisors and we gave her a panel and moved over to the side who was very good with new clients and just wasn't wasn't getting the runs on the board she deserved. She was a better advisor than that and you sort of realise that Oh, a lot of those referrals are because of Paul and I have been in the industry for a, a long time. Um, around town, people go, I'll go see Troy, go see Paul, go see the team. So it's realising, all right, maybe I do need to step back into that role of the meet and greet and then introduce the team and the quality and and then come into their meetings as and when needed as well. But the model portfolios was the key to doing that. It, it took the administration out and the burden. So if I walk into every room, I can ask the advisor, what's the allocation and if it's five in cash? You know, 10 or 20% in a real return and then core or growth. I know exactly where the money is and what that client's experience will be before I even open up on the TVs. We have the TVs with live portfolios where we do the reviews. Um, mm. So you're not getting surprises and I think that's the key that you know, the day of the old wrap and master trust and a client having legacy products, you just need to move away from that and move forward. Mm. Yeah, I think that you've got to have that consistency uh, as, or, you, you know, you've got to find a way that you do know all of those things. And if you don't have consistency, then it makes it a, a, a lot harder to get there. So what does it actually physically look like, the team that that's underneath you and how is it structured? You mentioned that you've got, you know, a couple of other ARs that are supporting you with supporting your clients and then there's admin team. But is it, and maybe I'm asking this question selfishly, that I might be able to get yeah. a couple of tips for our team, but... Um, yeah. Is it a dedicated admin that's linked to a, an advisor or is it like an admin team that's spread across multiple? What does the resourcing look like around that? Yeah, we tried a few approaches that it was more shared when we were probably up to 10 or 12 staff. And then myself and Darko, the other partner we brought in, so he does wealth accumulators. So he, he did win risk advisor of the year and all those things, which for me is fantastic because I can go, I've got an expert on tap. He's going to take it, mm. care of this. I, if it's a client of mine, I'll literally walk out of the room and go have a coffee and leave him with it because he's his, his and his team do that all day, every day. So we've made sure we've got more specialty. We've got a team that just do aged care and, and Centrelink advice, same thing. I'll bring that team in, do the handover, out the door. Uh, we don't all need to be doing the same thing. But when the teams do that 
roll and do it every day, they get better at it, they get more efficient. So, uh, and the other thing we did is we have a standalone review team that they control the review process. So, uh, like a platinum client might be every six months, they'll control, they'll call the meetings, the documents, everything, ensure it's done, uh, making sure we're meeting all the FDS and all those obligations. And my team aren't sitting there personally doing that. So I can mm. literally walk back, grab a pack, you know, 20 seconds before a client walks in, I know exactly what it will be. We turn the TVs on, we log into the portfolio. It's the same experience for me every meeting and it's repeatable and we know where it is. And then I can bring one of the other team in from my team, you know, they, they are in their 20s, they can sit in front of a client with seven to $10 million then and, and really participate in the meeting and, and be seen as the go-to for, for a lot of them. Like those sort of style of clients generally a lot further down in your career. I know I had to wait a long time. Um, <laughs> but how do you bring that forward? And it's 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 really having that team approach. And you, you pick up good tips like, you know, one of my, my good mates, Rob McGregor from GPS Wealth there, you know, it was about six, seven years ago, Troy, one day you're not going to want to kick the goals. You're going to be so excited when your team kicks them and you'll be able to clap right. more like the coach. I'm like, mate, that would never happen to me. I was like, <laughs> mate, I'm now I clap, I'd rather kick in the ball, pass, here you go, go. And you see the joy yeah. on the effort. Probably, the, you know, you do change as your career goes through. Um, yeah. But, yeah, from that perspective, adopting that team approach, and, and that's certainly what's coming out of the US. That's what came out some of those barons when mm -hmm. you talk to I mean, they're insane. They manage billions of dollars with three or four people. I don't know how you do that because compliance mm -hmm. in Australia is heavy. Um, a ideal client, you know, my team are probably that, one to six, seven mil, and the and seven, ten mil and above is they probably get a bit more hands-on service um, in there. Those sub that mil, that five hundred to mil, we have a team tooled up to do that. Um, got a female advisor, fantastic. In her thirties, there taking care of those clients. That's really her sweet spot. And then those that have some aged care entitlements, we do have a designated aged care division. They will do clients that are needing part aged care and part income. Uh, support there because they are uh, they're tooled up to do that. We have some of the uh, the people in there, and that's probably been our busiest team because we're we're adding to that. That's that's probably more our give back. It's definitely not the most profitable division in uh, in financial services. So people looking mm -hmm. somewhere to go, everyone sees all this aged care. I'll give you the tip. It's not it because it is. You're dealing with families. You're dealing with dynamics. It's very stressful. It's got to be done quickly and. Mm -hmm. the actually charges not a significant amount um, based on what's going on. But for our clients that we've now built to a level, it's probably our retiree clients are using it for their parents and they always laugh at me in their 60s and 70s. It's like, no, their age gap is probably 20 years to their mum or dad. So they're dealing with their own retirement, they're dealing with their parents going into that. So we hmm. sort of had the service we needed to provide and, yeah, it, it does add another string to the bow. Totally, yeah. It's crazy complicated, that stuff, and that's just from a technical perspective, let alone the personal dynamics and the things that, you know, that go, go around those those decisions. It's also the sort of thing, in my experience, that you only really get one bite of the cherry with as well. It's like you're going to structure things in a way and then, you know, it's going to happen. There's no going back from there. So it's like you've got to get it right uh, at the start and from the nature of, you know, where people are at at that stage, it's... Typically, again, in my experience, I found it challenging for people to accept a fee that's commercial, given all of those those inputs um, that are there. Probably helpful if they've got their kids uh, as clients that understand and, and know you guys are ready that um, might be able to help or, or help guide that process. But, um, yeah, I think it's the sort of thing that you want to have a strong muscle before you start dabbling in there. Uh, otherwise, that can lead to, lead to trouble. Troy, yeah, from our perspective, that's really where we found that you needed to have a specialty and, and that, that's probably the evolution from a, a generalist to running all of a practice to picking the areas you enjoy doing, specialising and then allowing your team to specialise and that's probably the evolution we've been on and still on. Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like obviously a lot of changes over the, the time that you've been in business to get from the point where you're you know, one advisor out there seeing the clients, doing all the work yourself to the way that you've got things structured now, teams, teams of teams, the specialists in different areas. What have, what's been the most challenging part of that evolution for you? There's certainly lots and they pop up when you're not expecting them, I suppose. It uh, can be anything from administration platforms suddenly having issues from nowhere to, to that. It's, 
it's that constant unexpected, I suppose, that just keeps rearing its head and, and having the ability to get back up. So I think I think having the right team of people around, like we we moved to a licence and a co-op there. We've got Q from Centaur. Uh, we've got Evalesco guys and Jeff and Marshall and um, uh, Guide Financial up the Sunshine Coast. So having a good team around you, I think, has been the key. It's, it can be lonely out there otherwise in Vice Land. We came out of professional investment services where we had a really, you know, through the 2000s to probably... 28, 9, 10, you know, you had big conferences, you had a network, you had a community, and that all sort of fell away when when markets sort of had issues and dealer groups broke up and then banks move out of industry and it sort of fragmented everyone. So I think, you know, that's where the likes of GPS have popped up and some of those groups to give people a sense of community. We, we went out, we had a, a desire to reduce costs for client, reduce margin and, and everything, which was our mm. passion at to build and, and to do that, we needed to be self-licensed. Then we needed to work with uh, then Premium worked with us to to get agreements with product providers and pass it back to the client. And then size and scale. Now I think we've got nearly on a billion dollars between the, the offices in our model management approach, and that just gave us more size and scale to reduce that to clients. And now the evolution of that is well. Now how do we actually take that out even further even to the marketplace or external advisors to use and have it documented going. This is what we've built. It's taken a long time, and as we can get bigger as a group, uh, we can get more discounts. We can pass those to clients, and and here's the process. So that evolution's ongoing, and that's probably taking a lot of focus at the moment. Um, how to do that? And yeah, we've had to change structures and all sorts of things along the way, and and yeah, I think that ability to just have the right people around to to get you through. Because if I look back to two thousand six, seven, eight, you know, I was the classic advisor there what would i have been there mid-30s ish and then heading to burnout because you're trying to do everything and I, I went to a conference overseas and for me it was the values-based advice that was that that was we're in hawaii pis had a conference i just grabbed that and came back and totally changed the way we did everything from that perspective and, mm. and paul same conference and ron kaufman presented there and it was uh, around process and 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 this milkshake story you used today and you know, what in your office makes you look silly that you can do that you tell people you can't. And, and we keep those two lens. So we've got passion for different areas and I think that's what really works. Yeah, I think that balance is important. And also like uh, having other people in similar on the similar journey around you as well. I know, um, you know that's why the, the XY community sort of kicked off back in those early days that it's like if you, you without the you know, the being in a bank or being in some big institution that you are sort of just going at it on your own. And one of the thing, one of the great things about advice is that people are generally pretty happy to share their secrets when it's helping, ultimately helping, you know, the consumers at the, at the end of the day. And um, that puts things into perspective because if you're just toiling away all on your own, it's sort of, it's easy to feel like you're the only one that's sort of going through it, but everybody is, uh, is sort of in the same boat. So, that having good people around you is important and obviously get some good ideas from, um, you know, those other guys. Plus, I'm sure Hugh's probably got good jokes or something that he can add to the to the, uh, to the party. <laughs> yeah, and that's what it is. And that, you look at those and that, like he, I, I, you know, it was around that mid-2000s in there when Hugh and I sort of became mates. And, and at the time, I'd won a couple of the awards and I was speaking all over the place. And that was really when I was getting tired and you, know, you get someone to give you that that sort of pep along, which is good. And like he's taken up the mantle out running around talking at lots of different events. You know, Paul's done that for a long time. So in our firm, Paul will go and do that. It's not that I'm not engaged. By the time I'm running the team, doing the models, I've now kicked off a, a monthly radio show that's taking a bit of time for retirees. It's just uh, FM talk back there. It's just the give back. So everyone's finding their different ways to do it. I've, I do stuff mm. through the girls' school, president of the father's club and things there so i found my avenues for give back there um mm. you know, it's it's just as pe different people pick up the mantle from time to time to help out other advisors but yeah you do find everyone's pretty open and sharing i don't i don't find ours as an industry or a profession that people aren't it's just probably time poorness is what stops a lot of it uh, you know if someone wanted to ring up pick you and have a coffee and sends me a message it's probably not a problem at all but from that perspective it's just having that time to go out and do it on the yeah. biggest scale is where people struggle. Absolutely. Um, Troy, I'm keen to you talk about the the Barons list and not so, I think it's obviously it's a, a great what 
those guys are about, but um, just the substance that actually sits behind that. Um, see that you've been sort of listed there uh, since 2017 or yeah, 20, yeah it's an interesting one. That it, yeah, it, how did that evolve? I mean, the Barons list, they brought it to Australia and I don't know how he first got invited. It was an invite to, to appear and, and put figures forward, but it, it gives you access to some of the some of the, the firms that don't may not be as engaged in the advice community, like I don't know, maybe the Morgan Stanleys and and some of those big large Macquarie groups that you know you, you tend not to see them at different events. Or I don't I certainly don't come across those guys in, in mm. function or, or alike if there's um, you know many conferences around the place. So it it has spread that you know the broader community it just gives you that interaction. Um, it's probably a different model to what most advisors are running because they're they're large institutionally run groups. Well, I think the majority of industry are probably uh, you know more advisor with a handful of staff, depending on different scale and, and building and growing. So um, mm. they they do run a totally different model. So it's interesting to see you know the trend for them is definitely towards you know wholesale larger clients and above, and I think that. That leaves a massive opportunity for the advice community for those clients, you know, up to probably that one, even two million dollars. That you know, we can add a lot of value. They do want and are happy to pay for advice. They're appreciative. Mm. Um, for us, that's a real sweet spot as a firm because those clients are really appreciative. Uh, if you can keep them on track, keep them updated, uh, show them a strategy, let them know what's going on. Um, I find that works really well. Some of the you know, the high net worth clients, they come with high needs, high time commitments as well, which mm. is hard to have a number of those. Uh, and they tend yes. to be distracted because they've got so many other opportunities and things they're exploring. Um, mm. So, yeah, it does just give you a different breadth of knowledge. And, you know, the weird thing is when you're finding these style of advisors out there going, well, we don't deal with anyone now under one or two million dollars. It's it's sort of a, a, a big change from where the industry was five or ten years ago. Mm, yeah, and there's a lot of those when you actually look at the list themselves that they, people talk about their minimum balances and where they won't see clients underneath. And I think a lot of people think that in order to make a list like that, you have to be dealing with those ultra high net worth or the, you know, the eight and even nine figure type portfolios. But um, yeah, it sounds like that's 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 not the case. It's just um, managing the money, but doing it at scale. Yeah, from there, I mean, look, there's no doubt that those big name brands do attract some of those larger clients because they're going there mm. for the first brand. So that that that's something we've still got to get over. I'm not sure where we would rank in size at the coast, but about half a half a bill or more, somewhere around about that, depending on what markets are doing at the moment. But it, um, it it's one of those things. Even at that scale, you're not finding those massive clients just walking in the door, going, "Oh, you know, you guys have got size and scale and and, and have been around a long time." So yeah, that, the name brand definitely helps. Troy, what's the um, most difficult skill that you've had to master to be the advisor or business owner that you are today? The most difficult skill is when you hand something over to someone and they're not going to do it the way you would do it. And that, <laughs> that really is a struggle. For I struggle with that for a long time. If someone's doing an 80 or 90% in my little world of how good it could be, um, you got to get past those issues, and then, then you do find them running with it. And as they get more confident, they're probably doing a better job than you would do anyway. But in those initial stages, that was really hard to hand over control of different areas and outcomes to people. Once you get to a size and scale of momentum, you're forced to it. So you you sort of lean in as opposed to mm. leaning out. And and yeah, once I've got to that and embrace it, now it's fantastic. Like I walk into a meeting now. Oh, so if I don't have to be involved in that, that's fantastic. Whereas, you know, even five, six years ago, I'd be still trying to have an opinion. It's like, no, no, just, you got this. <laughs> so I look forward to it. So I, don't, I don't need to be here, do I? So it's, yeah, it's just, but that's the evolution. It's just having the right people around you as well. Any tips on how to, like, uh, make it easier to do that? Or it sounds like it perhaps it's just grow to the point where you physically can't do it yourself. I think it's just accepting and recognizing it. We won't put ourselves through as this NCAD program around biases and things. And, you know, it's a bit of a look in the mirror and it's like, yeah, you should be dog headed, like things your own way and all those things. It's like, yeah, okay. But I, but I'm still probably, I don't know. I don't sit still. So I'm, I'm still in the door here by 
half past seven and 5.30 to 6, I'm wandering out. So I, I don't find it a chore coming to work. I don't. I like things to be done when I go home. I used to take work home. I don't now. Yeah. I will not work at home. So when I go home, I'm home. That was one, yeah. one good tip I picked up somewhere that probably there was a, a reasonable period of time I wasn't as present as I should have been in my own house. And you're sitting at a conference and someone stands on stage as your family getting the best or the worst of you and you went, oh, crap, you got me. Yeah, yeah. I'm running in the eating dinner, chucking the headphones on and playing on the computer and, you know, this is an exciting build, but when you got kids and everything there, they just want dad to be around and wife wants you to be around. So um, they're little things to learn along the way. Hopefully you, you learn learn and, and improve, but it's, it's still a still a process. So for me, that's why the you know the radio community get backing on the coast or the you know being the father's club get back at the school so that I can be a bit more present now than I'm in a position I can whereas you know mm. kids were born I was probably in the office well, I know I was in the office the next day because you're having that conversation with wife and we know what pays the bills and this client needs this done and, mm. and as a as a couple you you just have to do what you need to do as businesses grow thankfully you're not quite as time strapped for those situations. I think uh, I've sort of inadvertently stumbled on an effective strategy for being present at home, which is have your kids so close together that your wife just can't deal with them all on her own. Um, and <laughs> you're sort of forced into making sure that you're home for uh, for dinner and bath time and, and all the rest of it. But um, I still I still do some work from home, but I don't work in the evenings anymore. And I found that's that helps a lot with that that present and presence and um, you know making sure that they are getting the best of you at least most of the time. Troy, my last question for you: If you could, if you could go back to your 1990s, as you put itself, and and like fresh faced in the uh, in the advice game, and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, that's a tough one. I suppose. It would be just this. I went to a presentation the other week, and it was a. I was the head of Bond University, it, talking about the hero's journey, and I wish I'd heard that years ago. And basically, mm. you look at all those sort of stories. There's the ups and the downs, and everything in the in the end, and hopefully it all works out in the end. And it's just accepting that it's a journey more, because sometimes it can feel like really, you know, adversity is just coming at you. Why is this this way? Why do we need to do this? Why is that this? Mm. Why do I need to go back? To, why do I need to? Voice notes. It's like, oh my god, I just want to help these people in front of me. Why can't I help them? Because I have to give them eighty pages and a big bill. Mm -hmm. um, once you're accepting of what is there and moving forward, I think that's probably where I'm better at. And I certainly, I was terrible at it for a long period of time. So once you accept and 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 work with what's there, then everything becomes easier. It's easier to find solutions when you're not yelling and complaining at the problem. And it's those things you can't control and change that are put upon you and I think it's like when we all wanted higher education I want I don't want people walking in my door having had a horrible experience sold a product that was inappropriate and shouldn't have been done I want them to walk in either they've got new money there was a they may have had an issue with advisor on service or something but fundamentally the advice was good and that mm. that's where we get to and hopefully we do you know, there's less of those issues but you do still see that walk in what was the pain we have to go back and do more study you know, I had a business degree, a DFP, a CFP, and went, oh, I've got a fair bit of study there and 20 plus years of CPD, surely I'm from the TAS or accredited, whatever. But, you know, we went back and we did the ethics and we did the FASIA exams and we we just rolled with it and said, all right, we're just going to embrace it and hopefully the outcome is a better industry and the industry is then a profession and when we're there, then we're all happier. And, and I think the carnage has been the number of advisors left, but hopefully the quality that's left are there for the right reasons delivering better outcomes to more Australians and if we get to that then then that's great for everyone yeah well I think that now it's like the people that are here are the people that are committed to to stay and it doesn't guarantee success but I think it does help with ensuring that more people are getting better advice outcomes more often and I think that's what leads to that that more of the groundswell and getting that getting past that you know one in five number that they talk about with Australians getting financial advice something that I feel like was is sort of seeing a, seeing shift at the moment so I think it's an awesome time to 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 be in advice as that filters through Troy thank you so much for for sharing your insights um, yeah so so much gold there really really appreciate it. I know that you've got you've got plenty of plates you're keeping spinning so I appreciate you taking the time. No, thank you, and um, yeah, 
people like yourself need to keep uh, spreading the word and spreading the message and sharing with advisors out in the community because, look, COVID created really bad habits and made it really isolating for lots of people. So I applaud you on continuing to do that. I know, yeah. I think we've all got some rebuilding to do um, after being bunkered up for, for such a long period. But starting to get there, more and more stuff happening. So get around it. And uh, as you say, sharing that knowledge helps us all be better and um, have that sense of community as we're, as we're following that hero's journey, as you say, as well. Troy, thanks again, mate. And uh, team, we will catch you on the next one.